Welcome. My name is Sasha Goodfriend, and today I'll tell you about decision making and risk analysis lessons from warfighters. In classical decision theory, the approach to any problem is to maximize your expected utility or expected value, to be more precise. You are given a feasible set S, and you choose an option X which will maximize your expected value. In order to do this calculation, you need to have a good sense of what are the available alternatives, what are the available Xs, uh, what is the, the set of possible events that could happen uh, to you, and then their probability, the probability of these events. Only then you can uh, calculate the expected uh, value of uh, V. You can see the complexity, and that's why this type of analytical approach is rarely used in practice. It's too expensive and time-consuming to perform this calculation and gather the necessary data. In general, there is the idea of radical uncertainty that affects the ability to make decisions. You just don't have information about all the different things that could happen in any uh, unique problem. Uh, if you are re facing a, a common decision, a decision that you made before, like you're going to a casino, then perhaps you know what could happen and their probabilities. But in real life decisions, you're frequently facing unique circumstances that you have never faced before. You don't have a full picture of the future and all the things that could happen, much less their probabilities. Uh, there's a great uh, title uh, by Klein Orsano et al., uh, where it's called Decision Making in Action, which describes some of the complexities that decision makers face in uh, real circumstances. So today I will show you about um, a collection of solutions to this problem uh, that's partially inspired by warfighters and how they make decisions in the face of uncertainty. The outline of my talk is the following. I will give you a motivating story from ancient Greece uh, explaining uh, the circumstances of the decision making. And then I will generalize. Uh, so in part two, I will talk about a collection, a toolkit of solutions to uncertainty that I called RDOT, Risk Reducing Design and Operations Toolkit. Uh, I will then extend this further and uh, try to introduce a notion of analytical complexity, namely how really difficult it is to solve a given decision problem in light of RDOT. Uh, I would like to argue that forecasting is not the decisive factor and not the only factor needed in order to make decisions about uh, uh, decisions. In fact, there are other factors that could make a problem easier or uh, harder to solve. So war fighting, like many other domains, has many, many sources of uncertainty. There is, the, there is a lack of data on the enemy, the terrain, the weather. Uh, this is known as the fog of war. Uh, you also, as a warfighter, don't have information about the resources that might be available. Uh, you don't have a detailed plan, and you don't know what other commanders are planning to do, even on, on your own side. And there is also coordination and communication challenges. You frequently need to use novel or unproven weapons and tactics. Your intelligence information about the enemy is often incomplete, and moreover, the enemy frequently can adapt and change their tactics. In fact, the enemy can also use deception in this direction to further make your calculations harder. Uh, and this happens both at the strategic and political level uh, and at the operational tactical levels of analysis. So everybody has to deal with these types of uncertainty, both in warfare and also in business and engineering and, and many other fields. So here's a very interesting historical case. Uh, uh, this is the second Persian invasion of Greece. We are in the fifth century BCE, and uh, King Herfus of, uh, of, of of Persia is trying to avenge the defeat of his father at the Battle of Marathon. Uh, so uh, he decides to launch another invasion 
to subdue the unruly Greeks. However, he faces unknowns. Um, he doesn't know what is the strength of the enemy. Uh, he's also very concerned about the weather in the Aegean Sea that has sunk many Persian fleets. He's also worried about domestic coups that could unseat him. The Greek side also faces many unknowns. Uh, they don't know the strength of enemy forces that are coming against them. Uh, they don't know the enemy plan of attack and timing. And they're also very concerned about alliances. Uh, only two states, Sparta and Athens, are firmly uh, good in, uh, allied. Even then, they have many, many frictions. Uh, but there are 7,000 Greek city-states, and many of them uh, are not firmly on the Greek side. And in fact, many of them will uh, switch sides uh, to the Persian side. Uh, so what? how do they do it? Um, so what we know from, from, from history, what both sides did, the Persian solution to uncertainty is to increase the amount of forces they have, perhaps more than they strictly need, just in case they will, they will uh, face unexpectedly strong Greek opposition. Uh, so they're so much so that, uh, that uh, uh, Greek sources claim that the Persian invaded with several million people. Uh, even modern histori historians agree that they had for somewhere from 200 to 500,000 people in the invasion force. To deal with the weather, they come with a, come up with a solution. Instead of relying on the fleet to transport their troops, they land, they build land bridges uh, uh, across the Hellespont uh, and then position supplies to uh, feed the, the troops. To address coups, uh, the Persian king designates uh, a local commander, and indeed, at some point, he goes back to Persia to address the domestic situation, leaving this commander to uh, finish the battle for him. Um, the Greeks uh, <clears throat> also uh, build alliances, reserves, and capabilities in order to build as large uh, an army they can, particularly they heavily invest in the navy. Uh, they use defensive depth uh, in order to uh, uh, to fight easy battles uh, in the beginning uh, and try to stop the Persians before before uh, they reach uh, Athens and uh, other major cities. Uh, they also very carefully plan their battles in order to make sure that they are allies on their side. In fact, the decisive battle of Salamis happened where it was because the head of the Greek the the, the Greek navy. Uh, uh, realize that it will be a place where none of the allies will be able to flee from battle. So they were basically uh, locked in, in uh, trapped, uh, and had to fight. Uh, and that was was critical. Uh, they also used uncertainty. So there they, there was an elaborate deception plan that uh, Themistocles uh, launched. Uh, which caused the Persians to uh, rashly attack and, and lose. Uh, they also, they, you know, tried to use uh, time in order to win, um, and so they um, they delayed the the fight of battle in order to or hope, hopefully natural disaster, weakening weakening the Persians, which they did. Um, so what do we see here overall? Uh, what actually what we see here are manifestations of universal decision strategies. Um, uh, so the principle of mass building the largest army is the principle of robustness. Uh, uh, the principle of delegation uh, is a principle that's used in uh, many management uh, settings uh, of delegation or coordination in order to deal with uncertainty. Uh, commanders frequently use time uh, to build adventures with opportunities, as do many businessmen, defense in depth, uh, which I mentioned before, and use of early warning and intelligence in order to detect uh, threats and hazards. So this is something that's very commonly used in engineering as well. Uh, many, many strategies, but not all, 
of the cells that we see in warfighters, you see in other, other areas. Now, so over the last couple of years, I've been collecting and cataloging strategies used for uh, decision making under uncertainty. These are strategies that help make decisions or strategies that have reduced risk. And, and I call the catalog RDOT, the Risk Reducing Design Operation Toolkit. Uh, the uh, the list of that this catalog has been created by looking at papers and monographs from different areas, areas that I'm very familiar with in engineering operations research, but also areas that uh, just uh, that I read up on and uh, added to this catalog. This is by no means a complete list, and I imagine that um, uh, that uh, the many many strategies will be added to this growing catalog. In order to be included in our doc, a strategy had to appear in two different fields. Uh, so uh, here's here's ex some examples of strategies, and I highlighted strategies that are particularly relevant uh, that that appeared in military sciences, but they also appeared in at least one other area. Uh, so alphabetically, the first one in the R doc catalog is accelerate adaptation, which means uh, if you're facing uncertainty, what you want to do is you want to be able to, you, you want to develop more flexibility in, in your organization uh, so that you could more easily adapt. Uh, and frequently, you, and this is in an adversarial setting, is particularly important, you want to be more agile than your adversary. Uh, let me pick up another one. Uh, it's an example of dispersed storage. The dispersed storage uh, is also used in warfighting, particularly when you're facing an aerial threat. And the idea here is that you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, another uh, analogous situation. So you store your critical resources in multiple places so that if one of them gets uh, attacked by the enemy, then at least you have reserves somewhere else. Uh, um, so this long list could actually be organized, and I identified four types of RDOT strategies. Um, so the first one is configurational strategies. So these strategies are useful when you have control, uh, you can engineer uh, the system in order to, be, to make it more robust, resilient, uh, and better in the face of uncertainty. Uh, defense in depth, popularization. It, it, these are the, the, they are very frequently appearing in engineering context, uh, but of course, not every decision problem allows you to have that flexibility. Frequently, you have to deal with what you have; you have no control. Uh, for example, in science, when you're trying to uncover uh, the, the nature of some natural phenomena, we have no control over the phenomena. Uh, we can only change how we investigate it. The second category are reactive strategies. So these are strategies that improve detection of events and subsequent responses. So um, anomaly detection, standoff interdiction, incident response unit. Um, uh, these are strategy, strategies that, are, that appear both in military sciences, but they also appear in software security. They also appear uh, in environmental risk management and many other fields. Uh, formal strategy is actually the most common strategy that I encountered. Uh, these are strategies that involve uh, formal algorithms of workflow. Uh, an example of this is system simulation. Engineers who are trying to uh, discover the potential risk in the system, they try to build a simulation. Uh, there could be a computer model, an agent-based model, and then discover if there's any unexpected behaviors that they need to uh, deal, deal with. Uh, an approach, for example, that's another approach of this kind is called hazards. Uh, where you investigate hazards in an industrial setting uh, <clears throat> and discover new risks. Uh, um, there's something called hypothetical deductive method um, used in medicine and many, many other types of solutions to uncertainty. Uh, lastly, there is cross-cutting situations, so they usually fall into one of the formal categories, uh, but they have a very special flavor. Um, so there are strategies that are specifically useful in adversarial settings so when you when you are when you have a, an enemy in the military context or when you have uh, something like a cybersecurity threat when you have an attack or a criminal. There are situations with strategies that are useful for harnessing beneficial uncertainty. Um, most common example of this is in marketing where you basically uh, send out a campaign and you're trying to maximize the response or conversion rate. Uh, how do you deal with that type of uncertainty? 
Um, and lastly, there are strategies that are sort of meta strategies. They enable uh, future options. Um, these are strategies uh, uh, like basic research. The basic research usually does not uh, give you a solution or technology, but it can show you uh, and enable new technologies in the future. Um, where does R dot sit ref rel relatively to other uh, um, uh, to other solutions? Uh, the uh, R dot is complementary. Uh, so, uh, classic decision theory gives you a solution that are guaranteed to be optimal, uh, but it requires you to know the event space alternatives and have estimates of the probabilities. Then there were decision heuristics, which are favored in the behavioral economics theory, uh, in psychology. These are strategies for decision making that allow rapid decision making, uh, but they do require a list of alternatives and are frequently highly uh, suboptimal. R dot uh, gives you a third alternative. So these are types of solutions that are up. Uh, uh, they don't require a list of knowing all the alternatives, uh, the knowing the events or the probabilities, uh, and so they are potentially they are potentially quite useful, but they do require quite a bit of expertise to apply. Uh, lastly, there are other alternatives that I don't have to discuss, uh, but you can. But there is a fascinating literature, the naturalistic decision making. Uh, you know, Gary Klein is kind of the per, the person that have been trying to build this up over decades. Uh, take a look at that paper. Uh, so I think that rare doc is actually represent an, an address to the challenge of radical uncertainty. Uh, some difficult to forecast problems are solvable for Ardon, with Ardon. Uh, you know, one interesting example is uh, crossing an ocean. So when you go back to the age of Columbus and Magellan, uh, they have limited understanding of geophysics, of fluid dynamics, or shipbuilding, and yet what they they did manage to cross an ocean despite a tremendous amount of uncertainty. How did they do it? They did it by um, building ships that are robust, uh, building ships that are uh, sending multiple ships. Only it, it was in a famous I think a famous story of Magellan came only one of the ships from the Magellanic fleet came back, but it was uh, in a, one of the smaller ships, but it was loaded with precious spices that made the whole expedition financially successful. Uh, there are strategies like multi-layer defenses that work even when you cannot forecast a risk, uh, uh, forecast for possibilities, such as the case of AI. Uh, so there is a sweet spot of strategies which are very difficult to forecast, uh, but are quite addressable using the RDOT techniques. Uh, but I would certainly admit that there are strategies such as the wicked problems in public policy where RDOT is not useful. Um, now, what, what we are in, we are in a very interesting situation now. We are in a situation where a lot of problems that are difficult to forecast are, are easy. And uh, an example of this would be something like an investment decision. Uh, the investment decisions are is are a classic problem that is very difficult to uh, to uh, to solve in general. There are thousands and thousands of possible securities, uh, and there are uh, and uh, people like Keynes and Knight would talk about how it is a problem that is difficult to address with probability theory. But frequently, when you are trying to make an investment decision, you go to an investment advisor, and the investment advisor tells you. You should choose either to put 60% of your money in stock and the rest in bonds, or vice versa. So it reduces the entire decision problem into two alternatives. Having just two alternatives instead of a thousand alternatives make the decision vastly easier. Uh, so what I wanted to explore is to figure out some universal uh, ways of characterizing the hardness of the problem. Uh, previously, the literature on hardness focused on, pre on purely how difficult it is to forecast the system, how complex the system is. But I don't think these are the, the these are necess necessary for a problem to be solvable 
or easy to solve. Uh, so instead, what I try to do is I try to look for pivotal properties of a problem. These are properties that are necessary to admit an arduous strategy. Uh, I mentioned configure, uh, uh, that many of the strategies are configurable, but some of the systems are not uh, uh, configurable uh, by themselves. So that's a necessary property for all these configurational strategies. Uh, there, are stra there, are ha there are hazards or risks that are not detectable uh, and other ones that are detectable. So having this detectability property enables a lot of our strategies. Learnability, uh, small action space is another example. Uh, it, so overall, I found 19 pivotal properties and decision problems. Um, and there is a paper that appeared just this week explaining uh, the, the, how these strategies were found, how these properties were found. Uh, using these pivotal properties, we can define what I call analytical complexity of a problem. Yeah. So given the problem Z, such as an investment problem, um, we can define something that could be called Q uh, I of Z, which is to the extent to which the, pro the property resolves the problem. This is a deliberately a little vague, uh, but the idea here is that uh, just like an investment uh, decision, if you go from a thousand possibility to two possibilities, then the problem becomes vastly more easy. Uh, uh, overall complexity could be any non-increasing function in QI. So, so for example, uh, and then one ex there are two, two examples here uh, for defining complexity. And you can simply take the product of one minus QI of Z. And so if you have a property that significantly simplifies a problem, then the overall complexity of the problem uh, decrease, decreases. Uh, if you set QI of Z to be constant, just to make it very easy to compute, then what you get is the following. Uh, uh, so you have a, a constant 1 of minus C, and, and the overall complexity is simply uh, the exponentiation of this uh, constant 1 minus C. Um, the more properties you have, the easier the, the problem is. So overall, I think R dot represents a versatile arsenal of strategy that does not depend on information. Uh, and, from, and I think that information about probability are known and known is less important than classical decision theory suggests. Um, I think that problem complexity is just partially dependent on information that you have available and rather depends on many other properties. Here is some literature. I think that a lot of the literature that I'm going to de de describe here is really a tribute to Herbert Simon and people like Giger Rancy who looked at, uh, at uh, bound rationality problems and, and heuristics. Uh, <clears throat> the paper on uh, complexity just appeared in PRJ Computer Science, and there's a preprint describing the Arduino strategies and the GitHub repo. Uh, that uh, describes a uh, uh, list of more. If you have any questions in the comments, I would love to hear from you. My uh, email is uh, below. Thank you very much.